All right, it's good to see everybody here tonight. Have a good number here this evening. And we've got quite a few on the live stream, too. Uh, go ahead and open up to Psalm chapter 9, please. Psalm chapter 9. Hope everybody's having a good week. We're going to try to get through Psalm chapters 9 and 10, and I thought about maybe even 11, but we'll just, we'll have to see. You know, if we keep the pace up of two chapters a week, that's going to be like 75 weeks we're at this. We'll see. All right, Psalm chapter 9, Psalm of praise and a lot of interesting things in here. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Uh, my whole heart. A lot of the Psalms, well, again, the, the idea of Psalm is also a song. This is one of those, as we've talked about in the introduction, a book of poetry. When it comes to praising God, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. Well, when it comes to praising God, when it comes to worshiping God, He doesn't deserve any less than that for who he is and what he's done. And that's kind of the, the angle that this psalm takes. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Again, this is why David's going to praise, and this is why he's going to praise with his whole heart. And so, you know, I kind of bring that over to us today as Christians in worship. You know, he, he doesn't deserve any less than that. Worship is a... It's, it's an act of participation on... All of our parts, not just a few of us and not just a, you know, a special class of Christian. Every Christian in the, in the church, in the New Testament, we are called a royal priesthood. We're living stones that build up the house of God. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 and then verse 9 talks about the church being a, a royal priesthood. Well, that kind of brings the imagery in your mind of Scripture of... Perhaps the Levitical priesthood and the Levites were the ones who were, who were in charge of the services of the tabernacle, which then, of course, ultimately became the temple. But a lot of these psalms direct, direct my mind in that direction of praise. And when we praise God, when we worship God, um, it needs to be with the whole heart. You know, so we talk about a lot of times when we talk about worship, we talk about uh, the five acts of worship, Right. So what are they? What do we do when we assemble together on the first day of the week? One, what's my job? <laughs> the teaching, preaching of the gospel, yeah. So we have what we call these five acts of worship. Um, and of those five, tonight we do four of them. Well, we do it, three of them, I guess, technically. We don't give of our means, typically. But there's only one act of worship that is specifically identified as taking place every first day of the week. And that is, of course, the observance of the Lord's Supper. You can give any time you want to. Now, it is, there's a specified passage of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, talking about the, when, the, the, when Paul was coming to Corinth, he tells them on the first day of the week, lay by you in store. Um, but we know from early on in the church that they, were, they gave seemingly on a daily basis. But, so when we gather on Sunday night, or rather Wednesday nights, um, it's always called Bible study. I know back years ago they call it prayer meeting, right? Um, but we still engage in acts of worship on Wednesday night. We sing and we pray and we, we talk, we discuss God's Word, we teach. And so... This shouldn't be any less of our whole heart. And that's something we ought to think about when we are in worship. Whatever, whatever we are participating in. And so I, I think about that a lot as I'm reading the Psalms because it is, again, a book that is full of praise. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. 
I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. And throughout the, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, one thing that we always see God's people doing is singing. And so far as I can think right now, the first, well, I'll ask you, can you think of the first instance of God's people singing, let's say congregationally, as recorded in Scripture? Anybody remember? Well, do you, I'm asking about the first time we see the congregation of Israel singing together. You're right. I mean, you had the Levites or there's a section of the Levites that were singers. Yeah, they had set they had set course and rotation of singers. But anybody know the first instance of God's people singing? Crossing the Red Sea, Exodus chapter 15. You have the congregation singing, and then Miriam uh, leads the women, and the women start singing together. And so, you know, from that time on, God's people are singing. And, I mean, you've got 150 songs right here that we're looking at. And so, and then, of course, through the New Testament, you know, one of the, well... Well, the angels sang... I'm trying to think here. Matthew 26, that's it. Matthew 26, 30. The night Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he did that, and they went out and they sung a hymn together, Jesus and the Twelve. And so, from Exodus 15 throughout the rest of the, New, throughout the, rest of the Bible, God's people sing. And so we see that throughout the Psalms. And singing, man, that's... <laughs> there are so many... There's a range of emotions that you can hit when you sing. You know, some songs are... Well, like the one John led tonight, we worked on that a bit Sunday afternoon. When the saints go marching in, that's, a, that's an upbeat, encouraging song, and there are a lot of songs like that. But then there are, more song, there are other songs. Um, one, one that I think of that is, I would say, an emotional song for me personally is, and I don't know if it's in this book or not. You never mentioned him to me. Is that in our book? I don't know. But man, that, that song will hit you. So singing is, is part of our worship to God, and we need to sing with our whole heart. I'm afraid sometimes we sing like, I don't want the person next to me, in front of me, or behind me to hear me. <laughs> and we, we hold back, and we need to sing. We're praising God. Everybody around us is praising God, and that's what we need to do, because He's the Most High, verse 2 here. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. One of the things that he talks about throughout this psalm here, particularly, are his enemies. And as we know, David had a, had a lot of them. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou sattest in thy throne, judging right. Verse 4. Um, well, we've, we've talked about that, so we're not going to continue down that line of thought. But God being a righteous judge, we talked about that last week. He's, he doesn't, there's no missing evidence. There's not going to be any technical issues in his court. Um, he's always going to judge right. And David is thankful and praising God for that. Thou hast rebuked the heaven. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to a perpetual end. And thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. So, again, David being surrounded by, the wicked, by wicked people, he sees their actions but the Lord, verse 7, shall endure forever. You're not going to defeat him in any way. You know, you might oppress me and cause trouble for me, but the Lord will endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. And I've talked about that a bit. God, you know, you, you talk about the nature of God, the character of God, and we think of, of all the goodness of God, and it's displayed throughout the Psalms and throughout the rest of the Bible, obviously, but the justice of God, that's what we're dealing with here. And I made that statement, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, but you know, when we stand before God in judgment, we don't want to face His justice. But if we're wicked, as is being discussed in this chapter, that's what you're going to get. You want His mercy in judgment. And we can... The, the, the child of God, when you read the pages of the New Testament, 
It's like, well, one passage I think of is Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. If we're right with God and walking in the Spirit, then we, have, we, we are in God's favor, you might say. And the psalmist talks about that too, about being in His favor. But if you're not, Psalm 9 and verse 7, He has prepared His throne for justice and He will set things right. He shall judge the world, verse 8, in righteousness. Now, when you look at that verse, somebody turn over real quick and read Acts 17, please. Verses 30 and 31. Acts 17, 30 and 31. He shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness, David says. Acts 17, 30 and 31. You know, so what, what you just read there, he's given, assh- he, he's given assurance to all men by this. By the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, we also know that he's going to judge the world one day. That one thing assures the next. And so the, the nature of this judgment is kind of laid out here in Psalm chapter 9 and uh, these first several verses. But I want you to notice what he does here then. So notice these words in Psalm 9. Look at verse 1. Marvelous. Um, Most high, verse 2. You get down to verse 7. God will endure. You know, you can't defeat the Lord. Righteousness, verse 8. Uprightness, verse 8. He will be a refuge for the oppressed and refuge in times of trouble. So you have these, again, there's not just one part of God's essence that's focused on here. It's not just the goodness of God. It's not just the severity of God. It's both of them. And then you have verse 10. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. And you've heard me talk about that before. So somebody turn over to uh, to, uh, Proverbs 22 and read verse 1, please. To know his name. When you know his name, you'll put your trust in him. And that's said in the midst of all of these different descriptions of God. Proverbs 22, 1, somebody. A good name is to be chosen over a lot of money. Well, that has to do with your, your character, your reputation. And so that's what we're talking about here in Psalm chapter 9 and verse 10. Those who know God's character, what he's like, that he is marvelous and most high and he can't be defeated and yet he's just and upright and he's a refuge verse 9 people who know that about him will they'll put everything in him they trust him and that's the idea throughout the old testament of this idea of trust in the new testament we see this word faith throughout you know and the part of the definition of faith is trust and in the old testament you see that word a couple of times the word faith But most often, it's translated as trust. And so, you know God's character, Psalm 9 and verse 10, His reputation, and you have a reason to have confidence in Him. Because you know how He is. Any questions or comments on those first 10 verses? Okay? Now we go right back to it. Because of all of this, what do you do? Verse 11, you sing. You praise God, sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. Zion was kind of a. It's most often it's used in the Old Testament to represent the city of Jerusalem, but it was actually like a section in the city of Jerusalem. Sometimes it's called the city of David, things like this. But we understand the connection with Zion in the Old Testament and the importance of Jerusalem. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Verse 12. Um, the, the New King James says, when he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. Well, God avenges in the sense that he seeks justice. And so uh, when people are oppressed and mistreated, 
Perhaps David here speaking of himself, he knows that God will make it right. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou hast lifted that, that thou that liftest me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I can tell God's people about your goodness. I will rejoice in thy salvation. The heathen are sunk down. And so there's this, again, there's another contrast here. The, the righteous man whom God has preserved and served as a refuge for, he's exalted, he's uh, uh, uplifted and encouraged. The heathen, well, verse 15, he's sunk down in the pit that they made. And we talked about that, I think, last week. Uh, we, remember, we mentioned Haman's gallows. Yeah, that was last week in chapter 7. Um, and so that comes out here again, the idea of, well, the trap that he set for other people the wicked man's going to fall in himself. The Lord is sworn, or I'm sorry, verse 16, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. And to me, that's kind of the central theme of this particular chapter is you know how God is, whether you're looking at his side of justice or you're looking at his side of mercy. Um, he, the, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own Hands, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. We see a few times uh, in the Old Testament this word hell. And it's, it's most often, most often it's the idea of the grave. Like when, when Joseph, when Jacob believed that Joseph was dead, he said uh, to his other sons, you're, you're going to bring my gray head down to the grave. Well, it's the same word here in the Hebrew language. The idea is the, the nations that forget God, they're going to be brought down. That's the idea here. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Well, with the wicked man, it does. With the ungodly man, there's, there's no concern for the needy and the poor. And again, that throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament is completely opposite of God's, uh, God's people's care for the needy and the poor. God uses His people to take care of those people, doesn't He? Um, part of the law of Moses talks about uh, when you harvest, when you reap your vineyards, you don't go over it twice. You leave the corners. Take care of those folks who, who need help. And particularly throughout both Old and New Testaments, you see these types of provisions for widows and orphans. And so with the wicked, you know, they can fend for themselves. But God, God always seems to make provision for those people. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. And that uh, verse 20, the way verse 20 ends there, that the nations may know that they are but men. And sometimes nations forget that. And governments forget that they are just men like, like all the rest of us. And that seems to repeat itself. All right, any questions or comments on chapter 9? Well, I, it depends because you look at verse 19, the, let the heathen be judged, put them in fear. I think that's a different fear than the, than the Ecclesiastes 12, 13 fear. To, to fear God, if you remember, I, I talked about that a couple weeks ago. To fear God, the proper concept of that word is to, is to view him in view, of who, in, in view of who he is and conduct yourself accordingly. It's not to stand there trembling waiting for God to smash you. It's, you know who he is, you know how he acts, how he judges, you know his mercy, you know all these things about him, and so you hold him in the proper esteem and you serve him accordingly. That's what it means to me to fear God, as, as I look at those scriptures that talk about that. But if you're a heathen, and you're ungodly, and you're going to be, well, as it says there in verse 19, be judged, then I think there's probably, should be a little more trembling 
and, uh, and fear as we think of it. Yeah. Matthew 10, 28. Well, and, and that's the thing, you know, the, <laughs> every, every time you see someone in the presence of God in Scripture, like, for instance, it, it was quite different in the Garden of Eden. They, they had, Adam and Eve had quite intimate fellowship with God. But from that point on, you, uh, you think of instances of, like, for instance, the burning bush, when Moses approached, God said, you take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. Now, and the same thing happened to Joshua, by the way, right before they went into Jericho in Joshua chapter 5. And that the concept is, is great, I don't know how to express it sufficiently, but a great amount of reverence. You don't do anything to violate the holiness of God. And there's some fear in that. There's some trembling in that. But, uh, you know, you see other instances like Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah was being commissioned by the Lord, Isaiah was trembling in God's presence. And um, I, I tell you one that I particularly think of when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus. Uh, when they realized who he was, do you remember what they did? They stepped back and they fell down. There's something to that. And a lot of times, um, people have this imagery of, of when, when I get to heaven, I'm going to run up and hug him. You better be careful. Um, <laughs> you better be careful with, with your thoughts, I would say. Some misconceptions out there of, of how all that works. Not, they're, they're certainly not enlightened from the Scriptures, I'll say it that way. All right, chapter 10. I really like chapter 10 because this is a, what he does here is, I would say, what we do sometimes. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest, thy, why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? This is the psalm, one of the psalms that asks that question, why do the wicked prosper? And I would say, I've asked this question and I would say probably you have too. And the idea of you know, how much longer is God going to let this go on? I would say we've probably all had that thought to some extent. So this chapter addresses that concept. So he, he then describes the wicked. He's asking, he's wondering, you might say, um, God, what are you waiting for? Because the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. The wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous. Whom the Lord abhors. And so there's a, there's a complete uh, uh, divergence of mindsets. God despises, well, uh, Proverbs 6. One of the, uh, one of the seven things God's, God hates is a proud look. And yet the wicked man is drawn in that direction. And oftentimes the wicked man is just that. He's arrogant. He boasts of his heart's desire, verse 3. He blesses the covetous, the wicked, verse 4, through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. And uh, his ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. In other words, he doesn't even conceptualize of one day he's going to be held accountable for what he's doing. It's, it doesn't even cross his mind. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. So again, the, the concept of kind of sticking your chest out and looking down your nose at people, being rather arrogant, is the description here. Here's what the wicked man says to himself, verse 6, I shall not be moved, I'll never be in adversity. And there are folks who approach life that way. Um, very arrogant. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. Okay, he's seeking to take advantage of people, is the picture here. Uh, in the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are, verse 8 here, privily set against the poor. In other words, the King James, New King James says, his eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. 
the arrogant, wicked man will, will go after anybody so long as it's to his benefit. and He doesn't put himself in danger. Uh, ruthless kind of guy, you might say. Verse 9, he lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. So again, this just goes on describing his mindset. Look at verse 11. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He'll never see it. Well, that's the supposition of the wicked man. Things are working out the way I'm doing it. You know, why stop now? Uh, and so, that's the description. Then you have the call to action. So verse 1, again, why don't you do something? Here's what's happening. Here's what's going to happen. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble. Wherefore doth the wicked contemn God? Contemn, the idea. Um, the New King James says, renounce. It, again, God, it's, it's like he doesn't even cross their minds. Uh, he, he's... Like, out of sight, out of mind, as we say. Uh, he hath said in his heart, thou wilt not require it. I'll, you know, again, <laughs> I can get away with it. Thou hast seen it. Okay, so here's a thought. Somebody turn over to Habakkuk chapter 1 and read, I think it's verses 12 and 13. Let me see here. Habakkuk 1, 13. Somebody look, read that for us, please. Okay, Habakkuk's asking the same question, and he's like 400 years later. Why don't you do something? It's kind of the idea here. But the, the idea here, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Wickedness. Well, here's the thing. So now we're reading this psalm that, <laughs> that says in verse, Psalm 10 and verse 14, what? What's the first phrase there? You have seen it. God knows very well what's going on. So like Proverbs 15 and verse 3 says, that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. And so the, the, the questioner here, just like with Habakkuk, okay, since that is the case, why don't you do something? What are you waiting for? Thou beholdest mischief and spite, the poor, uh, rather, to require it at thy hand, the poor committeth himself unto thee. The, the poor is defenseless. He's got no band of defense to help him out. He doesn't have any financial means to secure himself. The wicked man does. The covetous man does. And so the poor man depends on you. He's committed himself to you. Break thou the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness till thou find none. So come in justice. Uh, come in judgment against the evil man. And then what you have in verses 16 through 18 is praise again because of who God is. He is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of the land. And so the psalmist kind of sees like post-judgment, when the, after the wicked man's judged, they're perished out of the land. Thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. So it's, it's not that... It's not that God will not act, and it's not that God does not act. But David is presenting the case here, like, what are you waiting for? Again, just like Habakkuk does. And he has confidence in the fact that God will uh, arise in judgment because of, again, chapter 9 and verse 10, I know your name, I know what you're like. Any questions or comments on chapter 10? Chapter 11, <clears throat> in the Lord put I my trust, how say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. And if you trust in God, if your confidence in him, if your confidence is in him, you know, the, the concept, of why try to run away? The, the wicked is bent as bow, they make ready the arrow upon the string. A, a lot of times throughout the Psalms, this is the imagery that's used with the wicked man, it's like he's prepared for battle. Like he's ready to go into a, a physical warfare. 
uh, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You know, if you let this progress, if the wicked man continues to do this, and, and I try to want to r- r- run away from that, verse 1, well, what do you do then? Foundations are destroyed. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids try. And, and so this is what we call anthropomorphism, which is, the, uh, which is ascribing to God these physical human characteristics. Eyes, eyelids, ears, um, all of this different stuff. His eyelids try the, the, try the children of men. In other words, he sees what's going on. Um, verse 5, the Lord trieth the righteous. Well, so he tries the, uh, he sees the, the behavior, the conduct of the wicked man. But he also tests the righteous. Uh, as the New King James says, the King James says tries, tests. We're not talking about tempting. God doesn't tempt anyone, James tells us. So there's something to this. The idea is prove. God proves the righteous. Um, I, you know, I always think of Job. You know, when, when you read Job chapters 1 and 2, when Satan is there to give an account of what he's been doing, wasn't it God who said, have you considered my servant Job? He's the one that presented Job uh, in that. So that's the idea here. God proves the the, the uh, righteous. Well, think about Abraham when he was called to offer Isaac. The King James says that God tempted Isaac, or rather God tempted Abraham. Well, the word tempted is not, we typically think of it as temptation to sin, but the idea there is, again, proving. Abraham's faith was proven in that he didn't hesitate to do what God required of him to do. Uh, so verse 5 here, the Lord trieth, he proves the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Uh, man, there are things that God hates. And uh, again, that just, that just illustrates to me the, how much the Bible talks about the nature of God. Here's one thing that I think sometimes that that we can fall into a trap of, that I've seen particularly, is, well, I'll ask it as a question, okay? Why do you study the Bible? You know, is it to... So when I was a kid, I remember this. We had a, an aunt and an uncle who lived in Ohio, and we, my brother and I, we spent a lot of time with them on the weekends. And it was like every time we were there, they would have handwritten... Bible quizzes, and that's just, that's just one thing we did while we were at their house, and it was, you know, how old were we, 10, something like that, 10, 11, 12 years old, and every time we were at the house, their house, we went through these different Bible quizzes. You know, for kids, we need to, 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 to do that kind of stuff, to build their knowledge in the Word of God, but why do you, and why do I, why do we as adults study the Word of God? Is it just for the gathering of facts? I mean... You've heard me say that before. Anybody can study and read the Bible. Anybody's capable of that. But if our only goal in studying and reading the Bible is to, is to gather facts without having a, I would say, a deeper appreciation for who God is and what He has done, then we're missing out so much. Second mm. Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved. And, and the, the word translated study, in the New King James translates it, give diligence. In other words, effort goes into that process. And the reason being, so you can handle the word of God correctly. That's what it says there, isn't it? And so we need to know, it's, it's not enough, the point being here, it's not enough just to know some facts from the pages of the Bible. You know, Adam and Eve, well, they had Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel, and then they had Seth, and then they had more sons and daughters, and just to go through and know biblical facts. That's not bad. I mean, that's a good thing. But if, if, that's, a, if that's the end, if, that, if that's the ultimate goal of your study, then just to gather facts, 
you're missing so much because the Bible tells us who this God is, His character, and how He interacts not only with individuals, but with nations and the world at large and, and what He's done. And uh, I don't know, I, th- I think about that sometimes. It, for myself, I would say personally. Yeah. Well, wisdom. The Bible talks a lot about wisdom, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Study to know and understand. Right. Hey, that's, that's exactly the point I was getting to. And we talked about trust a little bit earlier. Your confidence. Placing confidence in God. And that's, I, you know, knowing the Bible's teaching about money, since you mentioned the, the bills of our, you know, our currency has that, well, it's even on our coinage, isn't it? In God we trust. <laughs> I find that kind of ironic knowing what the Bible teaches about money. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Uh... Anyway, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and an and horrible tempest. Well, a tempest is a, you know, like a storm, windy storm. This shall be the portion of their cup. The book of Revelation, when it's talking about the judgment that's going to come upon Babylon, the great whore, which I think is talking about the Roman Empire and the judgment that they would ultimately face, it said that they were going to drink of the cup of the wrath of the wine of God unadulterated. So one of the things that they would do in drinking the juice of the grape, whether it was pure or whether it was fermented, is they would mix it with water. But when it comes to the judgment of wicked men, the imagery in the Bible is it's going to be straight. It, it's what? It's going to be uncut. It's going to be, uh, well, <laughs> it's going to be like a horrible tempest when it comes to the judgment of the wicked. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Psalm chapter 11 and verse 7. Any questions or comments on any of that stuff? Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps it is. Yeah. Don't trust in, as, uh, as uh, Paul calls it, uncertain riches. Yeah, but trust in God who gives to all men liberally. All right, guys. We got through three tonight. <laughs> all right, appreciate your attention.